Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Community for Care program. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about teen stress and the stressors from parents, students, and the transition to college. Um, we think it's a very timely topic, given the beginning of the school year. Um, we hope to provide information and resources. That is our mission in the Community for Care. Um, our, we have a wonderful panel back here ready to, to provide you with all sorts of insights and information, and I'm sure they will be open to questions um, at the appropriate time. I'm going to turn this over to Mark Lehman, who's a licensed family therapist in Simsbury, and he will introduce the rest of the panel to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate it. Welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Lehman. As Cheryl mentioned, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and um, I have a practice in West Hartford in Canton. Um, and I want to just take a few moments to introduce uh, the rest of our panel here. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Dr. Nick Pinkerton, and I'm actually the director of the Counseling and Psychological Services Center at the University of Hartford. And I'm Meredith Brockbank. I'm the school social worker at Simsbury High School. Um, I make a lot of referrals to Mr. Lehman, and I um, probably know some of your kids in here. So nice to meet you. Thank you. So we're here tonight to talk about teens and teen stress. And it's certainly been a topic that um, has, uh, has been talked about for a long, long time. And it, and it seems in some ways that teen stress uh, continues to rise uh, for a variety of reasons. So we're going to get into a little bit um, around uh, the issue of what's going on for teens and why are they so stressed and um, talk a little bit about some things that parents can do um, and uh, hopefully have everybody walk away tonight with uh, one or two more things that they they didn't know coming in regarding their teenager. So this first slide, we talk a little bit about teen development and um, the, the teen's uh, body is certainly developing at a very rapid rate from middle school into high school as you all know from uh, recognizing that your kids are, are growing and having to buy new clothes and all sorts of uh, food and uh, excessive things. And, so, so a teen's uh, body is constantly changing, and those are the things that we can see, um, but there are a lot of things within their body that we can't see that is changing as well. And um, uh, if you take a look at this first slide, it talks a little bit about um, uh, some of the brain development. And for, uh, for a teenager, they're really right in the midst of their brain developing. Uh, the research shows that our brain develops from the back to the front and uh, our brain actually isn't said to be fully developed until we're 25 years old. So many of the teenagers that, um, that both uh, Meredith and Nick are seeing in, in uh, high school and in college are still really in the midst of all of that development. Um, and so some, some kids are, are really um, at a deficit uh, as a result of uh, that process continuing and um, uh, being in the middle of that. So things like uh, efficient thinking and impulse control, uh, managing emotion, uh, and judgment are all things that uh, we as parents um, certainly ask our kids and uh, expect our kids to know how to do. Uh, and many of them are, are really in the process or the journey of learning how to do those things. So I, I just, without going through some of the details of this, I just want to mention to you that they're in the midst of this major developmental piece and um, just something to keep in mind. The second slide shows a little bit about the difference between uh, a teenager or young adult that uh, I would consider to be at risk versus uh, one that is more typical. Um, now, uh, those of you that have uh, high schoolers in the house uh, and even middle schoolers, um, you know that not only is the development um, continuing at a rapid rate, um, but you're also seeing things like mood swings um, and uh, irritability for no particular reason, um, fatigue. And those are all things that are very common that go on uh, throughout uh, the pubescent years. And uh, some of those things are things that we would be concerned about versus things that we may not be concerned about. So if you look at this, this slide, you'll see that um, many of the things on the right-hand side um, are more extreme versions of the things on the left-hand side. Um, so things that do come up that are very typical um, are frustration and irritability, um, change in dress, change in friends, uh, occasional withdrawal. Um, so if you have kids at home uh, that will come home from school and their first move is to you know, go jump on the Xbox or go upstairs and read a book or just isolate, um, much of that actually is pretty typical and normal. 
all right? Uh, many parents will come into my office on a regular basis, and they'll say to me, I can't talk to my kid. Every time I ask them questions, you know, they, they, they give me one-word responses. How is, how is school today? You know, sort of a typical question a lot of parents ask. Um, fine. It was fine. Um, you know, what's new? Nothing. Um, you know, and some of those kids are answering those questions when there's a lot of things that are new um, and when their day actually wasn't so fine. So it becomes really important for parents to get a little creative in your asking of questions to kids and ask some open-ended questions um, and maybe share a little bit about your day. Because keep in mind that they haven't seen you and you haven't seen them. So chances are there was probably something that came up in your day that uh, they may find interesting, maybe not. Um, and uh, there's certainly maybe something in their day um, that would be helpful to talk about. Meredith, is this something? Okay, well going back to the other slide, um, working in the high school, boy, the changes uh, in kids that we see physically from f freshman year to senior year is huge. And so you can see the hormonal changes and, and um, and their lack of comfort with their growth and development and and it's all a bit clumsy and isn't all really functioning as an, a well-oiled machine so it's not surprising that we see them um, having different friends different interests not really um, always feeling like they belong because it's they're changing so much and so are all of their friends around them so it's a really um, it's a time of great change and transition for kids and so they feel like they're on un unstable footing. Um, with, with the um, slide that Mr. Lehman had before, I really like the, the um, juxtaposition between the typical and the atypical because um, I will get referrals and, and the other mental health specialists at the high school um, when we have students that are are feeling highly stressed or um, or worried or preoccupied about a breakup or uh, stressed about a, a test or their grades not being what they want to be. I mean the gamut. Um, that does not mean that we're at the at-risk point, but in the moment it feels sometimes like your child is at an at-risk point, even to us. And, and sometimes we don't really know, are we going to stay in that category or are we going to kind of come back to a more typical um, adolescent ups and downs. And most of the time, the majority of the time, all of our kids are really typical and they're going to have good days and bad days just like we do. But I think their emotions are heightened and so it feels enormous at the time. So you know we're we're always kind of using that judgment of of at what point are we kind of going into more of an at risk level, um, and 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 when we start to see a student staying in a more um, a pl more of a place of crisis than a place of homeostasis, then that's when we might look at referring a student out for outside counseling. And a lot of times kids will, you know, really benefit from that support and um, and be able to kind of mobilize all their resources and get back on track. So. Yeah, if I could just add to that, thank you. Um, certainly, um, with regards to the, uh, the difficult behaviors that come up for families, one of the things that I would caution parents to just consider is that if they are recognizing behaviors, not to wait too long to reach out uh, to somebody like Ms. Brockbank or, or a pediatrician or, or a counselor like myself, um, you know, um, or even uh, another family member who may have gone through similar things, um, certainly friends as well. So th there are people around us that um, oftentimes as uh, families are dealing with things, um, for example, an excessive weight loss. So let's say you have um, a child in the house and um, their regular growth is supposed to uh, increase each year. They're supposed to gain some weight each year. Um, and you notice that for no particular reason, um, you know, their, their weight has gone down. You're not really even sure how much. Um, you know, the move to make would be to, to try to address that and try to address it gently. Um, you know, and pediatricians are really skillful in the area to, to be able to do that, uh, along with uh, outside professionals. Um, but I just, I threw out the caution that uh, for, for some family members, they wait and they wait and they wait. And they come into my office and things are really bad. Um, you know, violence in the home, um, excessive weight loss, um, self-harm behaviors, stuff like that, that, you know, um, is very difficult to manage seeing a counselor once a week, for example. So just be on your toes as parents. If you're noticing those things, they don't develop overnight. Those are things that develop over a period of time. And um, you know, the one sort of basic um, suggestion I could make is don't be uh, fearful uh, to say something um, and have that conversation with your child. Um, chances are it's going to be awkward. Chances are they're not going to want to talk. Um, you may have to come back several times to have that conversation. 
you may decide to, to purposely choose an environment um, like a car where they're not looking at you, um, hopefully, and um, you know you can kind of turn down the anxiety as a result and just sort of bring it up, almost matter of fact, but bring it up and have those conversations because they're really, really important. So social media um, has become uh, certainly uh, the topic of many presentations that I've been doing uh, over the last few years, um, mainly because social media is uh, sort of the one topic that you get uh, an excessive amount of socialization that's positive, and you get some that's not so positive, all in one. And so parents are constantly asking, as I'm sure you guys are getting the question of, should I allow my son or daughter to be on Snapchat or on Facebook or on Instagram? Which is really a personal, I think, family decision to, to, to make. Um, but being aware of what's out there is really uh, the, the, the large suggestion that I would make around the topic of social media. So doing your homework, because we're really, we're all one generation away from our kids. and. Um, Kids are growing up nowadays, um, you know, not knowing anything but technology. And uh, we have, you know, the history of, of growing up in, in an age where, you know, certainly the te technology was totally different um, and social media didn't even exist. So for many kids, they feel as they're getting older that, yes, everybody in seventh grade, everybody in eighth grade, everybody in ninth grade has devices. Why don't I? Um, again, a very personal decision for parents to make, but be aware of when you are giving them devices to be on social media, be aware of what they're on um, and recognize that there is a hazard involved in that because um, there's a lot that's said on social media um, that you know, can, can certainly pass over you and, and you're, not, you're not necessarily going to be aware of. Um, so doing spot checks, for example, on a phone, um, having conversations way in advance before kids are getting technology about social media, um, because once something's put out on social media, it, it can't be taken back. Um, so having those kinds of um, parental conversations with kids long before it becomes a part of your world, um, and recognizing that for most kids, once they get onto social media, and I know you guys see this, um, they are on it a lot. Right, so it's not something you're going to be able to say to your kids. Just do this 10 minutes a day, you know, and uh, and that'll be great. Um, most kids are on it quite a bit more than 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 that. Yeah, of course. Um, one of the things I'll share is I I'm I'm a mother of two teenagers now too, and. It is humbling, and I will say, I think Mark makes it sound so easy, but I, I'm struggling as a school social worker even. Like, my kid has monosyllabic answers, and I, and I think it's, it, it just makes you feel clumsy. And, and you think, well, I have no trouble communicating with anybody but my kid. And, and, and believe me, even mental health professionals Absolutely. experience that. And so what I would suggest is try to kind of, um, and this is what I do, try to just um, kind of move through the awkwardness and, and move through the, um, the, the frustration that it's really not very fruitful and just keep trying and trying. And you just have to be relentless because I think that that shows your kid that you're curious and you're interested in, and you know, maybe, maybe it'll take six tries, but then maybe eventually they're going to say something to you. Um, the other thing I was going to say is um, I think having kind of like open-ended questions, not really targeting their behavior on, on their um, electronic devices, but more like tell me about this. I mean, this is what I do a lot um, with high school students is, you know, I, help me understand what Snapchat score is and what does it mean if you have a streak going with somebody that's 462 days? I mean, really, who cares? Does that mean you're popular? You know, and ask those kind of questions. What does that mean to you? And what happens if you, um, if you break that streak and, and, or if somebody stops a streak with you? And ask open-ended questions but without judgment, um, hard to do. And believe me, I'm in your shoes. But um, but but it's. I think it's it's all such uncharted territory for us. And I think just to ask our kid to help us um, explain what it means to them is is really important. Yeah, to speak a little bit more to the the social media. I think you're bringing up so many good points. I feel like one of the major changes that I see happening is that technology was always and and the identity that you created through your technology was always a bit separate from who you are in real life as a person. And I feel like some of what's happening with our young people is that there really is no separation. Yeah. It feels like their identity online is their identity. 
And you can imagine that, uh, I think it's also interesting that what we're seeing in some ways is that um, while adolescence is, and young adulthood has always been a time of, of trying to sort of get your freedom, of separating a little bit from maybe your family and really engaging with your peers, what we're finding is that uh, a lot of young folks, they're, they're, um, they're actually engaging with each other virtually. And so these are the, these are the unsupervised spaces the unsupervised spaces that when maybe we were uh, growing up, uh, we were doing and participating in things that maybe weren't all the best decisions for us, but we somehow made it through. A lot of uh, that now is happening when they're actually under your roof, when they're at home, when they're in their bedroom, and when they're unsupervised on their device. And um, I think that that's, that's sort of important to, to acknowledge that, that while, while they're protected and it seems like they're home, in some ways, um, being on their device, they're, they're exposed to an entire world that's really pretty unsupervised. So I think, yeah, just having conversations about this and, and talking uh, with them and, and finding out what, what it's about. And also, I loved the comment about sharing you know, stories, sharing what's going on f with your life, not only just day to day, but also when, when you were younger. Remembering that sometimes can be really helpful too to kind of put into perspective. What are some of the things that I might have done that uh, maybe it's a good thing there, there's not a, a surviving record digitally uh, for, for the remainder of time. Um, you know, and, and how can I help uh, my kid navigate through that? Um, it's, it's not an easy world. I, I also say um, socially the, the negative social comparisons that sometimes happen. Um, when, when, they're, when they're on the device and they're, um, they're looking at other folks, and so let's say they're looking at Facebook or they're looking at, it's like there's this constant um, sometimes pull to, to compare yourself. Am I at that? Am, am I doing that? Am I, am I like that? Uh, what is shown on Facebook, for example, are the really smiley, wonderful pictures. It looks like everything's hunky-dory. But is that reality? And it, it's not. And so sometimes it contributes to that negative social comparisons where they feel like, compared to everybody else, they're lacking. Uh, the other thing that sometimes happens is when, when uh, they are engaging uh, with each other, uh, they kind of document it excessively online, which can contribute a little bit to the folks who aren't there uh, to feel like I'm not a part of it. Yeah. Um, some interesting things, I just point those out, uh, they're there. Again, I think uh, it's a wonderful tool, it's a, a, but at the same time, boundaries are, are something I would, I would definitely think about. How can we all, and that's us included as well, th be thoughtful about what boundaries are we creating with our, uh, with our devices? That's a great point. You know, I just further that, that, you know, all three of us are parents as well. And we know, just to, just to reiterate what um, Ms. Brockbank was saying, we know how hard it is to, to talk to kids and um, how difficult kids can sometimes be to have conversations with. And um, so, you know, it really is a matter of, um, you know, I, I tell families sometimes in, in the office, it's sort of like fishing. You know, you got to throw your line in a bunch of times. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you catch a fish on the first time and, you know, most of the time you don't. So you just got to keep trying and, uh, and eventually they will have conversation with you. Um, make one other point about social media and it, it you know, it, um, it just sort of illustrates a little bit about the difference between our generation and, and our kids. Um, when, uh, when my son was younger, he's, he's now 16, 15, excuse me, when, when he was younger, um, I think it was about seven or eight, we were watching Superman together. And um, uh, he saw the scene where Superman uh, runs through the, um, the phone booth and, and changes. And he looks at me and he says, what's that? You know, um, and so you know, uh, just something to kind of consider that kids are growing up in a in a in a, in a way that you know um, is very different from the way we grew up, and um, as a result of some of this, just to tag it to to some um, you know anxiety uh, or, or depressive symptoms, kids have a really difficult time being patient, right? Because this stuff moves excessively fast. So, um, you know, that's something that I see a lot of in my office. And uh, you'll notice, and, and adults do it as well, but you'll notice for kids, um, the idea of not being able to pull a phone out, not being able to check your Snapchat, not being able to check a score or do this or do that is really difficult. 
Um, you know, I had a kid come in the other day to my office and he was really upset and really, really upset. And uh, when I sort of peeled the onion back to figure out why, he told me his phone had died and he didn't have it all day. Hmm. So he just wasn't used to that. 15 years old, wasn't used to that. So just something to keep in mind because I think kids are really functioning around social media and technology in ways that, that we, we certainly didn't. Oops. So the topic that, you know, everybody doesn't like to talk about, right? Um, sex and drugs, um, you know, is, uh, is nothing new. And, um, you know, certainly uh, there are people here, I'm sure, that have had conversations with their kids about this and people that haven't. Um, and again, for us, there's probably people that grew up not having conversation with their parents about this and some that did. Um, this is a topic, both these topics are topics that, you know, um, if I could just kind of cut through a little bit and say, you have to have these conversations. Because there's an excessive amount of kids out there using substances, and there's an excessive uh, amount of kids out there that are, that are having sex. And if they're not having sex, they're hooking up in some sexual fashion. And um, for a kid, remember the development slide that we had earlier, for a kid, they look at both as fairly safe, like very safe. Um, you know, and lots of kids will fact check with their friends who are just as lost as they are. So, um, you know, they're not necessarily um, getting correct information about this, th these two topics. Um, and so I, I tell parents all the time, if you don't have a lot of information about these two topics, talk to people. Police officers are great resources in town, um, and uh, pediatricians, awesome resources, certainly school staff. Um, we hear about these stories all the time. Um, you know, and uh, when the stories come up of, um, you know, a concert in Hartford where we had 90 kids go to, you know, the emergency room as a result of intoxication. Um, we hear about that as parents, you know, we gasp and, uh, and we move on. You know, we don't always talk about those things with our kids. So it becomes really important when we have things like that that pop up um, that you take that opportunity as a parent to say to your child, listen, these are things that are going on. These are things that may be going on around you. You may not, may not be partaking in the process, but you're certainly around it. Um, and you really can't get away from that piece. Um, so when you talk about these two topics, um, you know, there most parents, um, you know, I, I talk for a living, so I'm pretty used to doing this, but most parents are, are, are fairly awkward around these topics, um, and most parents really like to avoid and just kind of get a book. Can I give my kid a book, you know? And uh, can, I, can I hire somebody to have them talk to my kid about this? Um, these are two topics I would say to you guys, along with social media, the third topic, push yourself to have conversations with them about this. Again, if we take a look at sort of our generation and how certainly the drug piece has changed, um, you know, one generation ago, we were talking about kids in, 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 uh, in high school um, and even in college using substances, predominantly alcohol and marijuana. Um, now we're talking about kids using that, um, but also other stuff that's much more potent and much more hazardous. Um, so again, it's really, really important if you don't have the information uh, searched out and um, you know, certainly ask professionals, individuals that are dealing with that on a regular basis, and, and we'd, we'd be glad to talk to you more about that. I can say kind of like um, I, I was saying earlier with um, kids' friendships changing and their friendship groups changing. Likewise, this can change on a dime. Um, you can have a kid that's with a certain friend group and, um, and is clean and is really committed to staying clean, and then they m perhaps have a break in that friendship or they connect with other kids, and, that, and their um, willingness to experiment can change very, very quickly. So I, I would just pay attention to your students, uh, your child's um, friend group as well, because it's, um, it, it, can, it can go from zero to 60 very quickly. So, um, and, and again, have just dialogue, ideally, before you suspect that they're engaging in any of that behavior, so it feels a bit more practiced. Yes? What are good benchmarks? Is it a stress to go out going on in the driving car or something? Any suggestions about all the 
I'll pass the phone in a minute, but I, I, for me, um, I mean, I think that there's there's a certain lulls, hopefully, for all of us, at least a few times a week. And and for me, um, I sometimes come home and I'm just talking about school or the stressors or things that are worrying me. Um, and and that my kids, I tend, I find, kind of tend to hover around and they like to hear about things that are. Um, happening in my work day and then that sort of is naturally a, a time to, to talk with them but I think I think you know I don't know if not many of us have the privilege of having sit down dinners but if you have sit down dinners or if you're driving someplace driving to and from games um, watching a movie um, you know just processing uh, you know something that a rumor that a kid um, your your child tells you that they heard about another kid and just you know any of those slight little avenues where you can kind of um, direct the conversation in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, by the way. The fact that you even asked the question to me says that you, you care to look for that, and that, that's awesome. I agree so much with what you just said, um, Ms. Brockbank, that you know, looking for those opportunities is, is really important. Um, and, and nowadays, you don't have to look too hard. You know, if you listen to the music kids are listening to, there's a ton of opportunity to talk about sex or drugs. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't hear too many songs that aren't about one, you know, um, with kids. And, and certainly, um, you know, for my own kids, um, before they go to sleep at night um, is an opportunity for, for us to talk. And, um, you know, I find that uh, if I put myself in the position of, like, educate me, you know, I could tell you a little bit about what it was like when I was younger, um, but I'm not with you now in middle school or high school. Um, you know, tell me what that's like. I'm just curious. Um, I don't want to go to school with you. So uh, perhaps you could just give me a sense of what's it, what's it like to be a seventh grader? You know, um, kids will come in in eighth grade and they'll say, oh, I'm dating for the first time. Fantastic. What's that like? What does that mean to date in eighth grade? Kids love to educate us. And let's face it, we need to be educated, right? Um, the stance I, I generally recommend for parents is we can never know, know too much, right? Um, there's so much about our teenagers' worlds um, that constantly shift and change, number one, but also that we're just not knowledgeable about. Um, we're around it all the time, and we're constantly learning. So, um, you know, looking for those opportune moments to really ask those questions. And again, you may ask the question and say to them, hey, I heard this, this uh, particular thing in, in that song you were listening to. Any idea what that means? And they're like, I don't want to talk right now, Dad. Okay, got it. You know, that's a hook in the water. I didn't catch a fish. So maybe I come back the next time and try again. Um, but the fact that you're trying is a really good message to kids that you care. Really and you show them that you're listening to the music. Right, right, exactly. I'm always shocked about how graphic the music is, um, which I'm sure our parents felt about us when we were their age. But, um, but I mean, I, what what I feel is if there's really not a lot of innocence. There's just, I mean, you know, um, the nitty gritty of sex is discussed in detail in these songs, and it's it, it's um, it sort of demystifies the whole thing for them, and 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 they're not shocked by anything, and it normalizes. You know the expectation that maybe they should be thinking about these behaviors when they're 14 and 15 and 13, and so it's it's hard. But I think um, do I manifest that I'm not shocked? No, I show that I'm shocked. But um, but I I try to sort of understand like they can like my daughter can sing the lyrics to these really raunchy songs, but I don't think she's doing the behavior yet. But it, I'm aware that it's you know it's creating a comfort level, and it's you know it's an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to what it's like to have that transition to college as well. I think the biggest thing there is that um, at that point, there's just so much freedom in terms of what their choices are, in terms of where they're going, who they're with, for you know how long, how late they're out, uh, if they're going to drink, if they're not. There seems to be a lot of pressure that they they often feel. One of the interesting things is that statistically, we know that uh, students perceive other students drinking and using drugs far more than they actually do and that in some ways actually uh, you know encourages them to feel like they have to do what everyone else does um, the other thing is that that's important to know is if uh, we see sometimes students who maybe have never participated uh, in drinking or or drug use prior to coming to college but then they come to college and maybe they experiment and they try but maybe at that point, in some ways, they could be even at more risk because they have no idea what their limits are. And they find themselves in the first few weekends 
kind of going 100 percent in the opposite direction of where they were, and there's some pretty significant consequences. You know, a hospital transport later, um, or just a really significant uh, um, hangover, or something else that happened. Um, speaking of sex and drugs uh, and, and alcohol, they're, they're heavily linked. One of the things that we see is that the vast majority of sexual assaults that occur on campus happen with alcohol or drugs uh, involved. And so issues of consent, issues of, of sex, issues of if you're going to choose to be with someone, you know, what is the meaning of that? Can it be a meaningful thing? And there's pressure there too to sort of perform, to do things that you feel like everybody else is doing and it doesn't, you know, and I, and I have to. And, and well, actually, let, let's talk about that. What, what do you need to do and, and what, how significant could the consequences be? And not just fear tactics, but let's put some meaning behind what it means to actually choose to be intimate with someone. And having those conversations, uh, like where we said, are just so important, so important. And uh, they can be difficult conversations, but really important conversations. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So we're going to shift to talk a little bit about motivation. Um, this is a topic that, you know, like some of the others we've talked about, um, parents come in contact with and, and really get frustrated by on a regular basis. Middle, middle school, high school, and, and in college. And, um, you know, as kids are growing and they're on this journey toward independence, uh, sometimes they hit some bumps in the road where their motivation shifts and changes. And some of that is, is, is chemical and a, is as a re result of, you know, one of our earlier slides of development. Uh, and some of that is, is not. Um, so it becomes really important for you to kind of know your kid. And um, we really don't want to see any kid uh, going through high school and having their motiv motivation sort of tank right in the middle of high school. Um, that's probably the worst time for that to happen. Um, and if that happens, you know, uh, to an excessive rate, usually there's a reason. It could be something like, um, you know, substance use. Your child has perhaps taken on some new friends and they've decided to smoke pot on a more regular basis, which will certainly impact their motivation. Uh, sometimes they have psychiatric symptoms like depression or anxiety um, that, of course, you know, our, our kids at 14, 15, and 16 don't, you know, don't have an awareness of what that is, um, but they do know how that feels. And then sometimes they have things going on uh, for them that aren't psychiatric related uh, where they just decide, I'm done. I don't really care. Um, I don't really care about school. I don't really care about extracurriculars. Um, I don't really care what, what Mark Lehman has to say. You know, I'm done. Um, and so, you know, you find yourself with a sophomore or a junior in high school trying to talk and motivate them. For my purposes, when I talk to kids about motivation, um, it's really important to look at every kid as a unique young person. And every kid is motivated typically a little bit differently. Um, some kids are motivated by, by praise, and, um, and some kids are motivated by um, hobbies and interests. Some kids are motivated by grades. Um, but knowing your child and knowing how your child is motivated, um, and if you don't know, trying to figure that out, because really part of the journey for them is also trying to figure out how to be motivated. Uh, most kids that I meet, I would say the vast majority of kids that I meet in my office, um, don't enjoy being you know, um, poorly motivated. Um, they don't enjoy having a low self-worth. Um, so when you turn them on to something that actually feels good, um, you know, most kids will really enjoy that. Now I want to be really clear. There are things that are motivating that are healthy, um, and there are things that are, that are motivating for, for teenagers that are not so healthy. Um, so we don't want kids joining like the varsity pot smoking club. Um, we want kids making opportunity for themselves and joining things like, um, you know, some of the wonderful activities uh, that are offered up at the high school, um, both sporting activities as well as extracurricular type activities that really improve a child's self-worth. Um, so really encouraging them to try something new if they've never acted before or, you know, never participated in some of the dramatic arts. We've got a phenomenal program in town here. Um, and uh, if it's not that, perhaps it's something else. 
Um, I've been really impressed um, over the years. My daughter's a senior in high school here, and I've been really impressed over the years at all of the different offerings they have. Everything from volunteering, uh, you know, to um, to athletic uh, types of activities. So, if your child is someone who uh, isn't involved, um, taking a look at what is offered and certainly discussing with some of the school staff what is out there for them to partake in are all great ways to increase their motivation. I'll, I'll completely second that. When I get a referral um, on a student at, at the high school, um, one of my first things that I want to explore with them is if they're interested in any kind of extracurricular activity. And that's a real sign of um, it's a good resource and support um, because it shows that they're connected to something with other peers as well. Um, so uh, like Mr. Lehman says, I think if it's not sports and after school activity and here the library, the, um, the teen librarian here is fantastic and she has all kinds of really great activities. And so it's, it's, it's hard to kind of come up with nothing with any kid. It's just a question of really kind of plumbing, um, plumbing the resources and finding out what, what, what they're passionate about. Um, but that's a real sign of mental health to have a kid connected to anything. It's a, it's a red flag for me if we can't find anything to, for a kid to connect to. So. And keep in, keep in mind as well, um, in many ways, you know, kids are, are suffering with anxiety through um, you know this journey through middle school and high school and, and college for lots of different reasons so anything that we can offer or sort of steer them in the direction um, of, of being able to manage that without hazardous consequences is, is generally a really good thing um, so really being on the lookout for, for those types of activities whether they're offered in town or at school um, but really letting you know your, your, your kid know that that's really a life skill um, it's a skill they'll take to a college campus. It's a skill they'll have way beyond that to be able to manage their own anxiety levels. Because let's face it, you know, life doesn't necessarily get easier as they get older, right? I mean, generally you see more stress. Um, so having that ability to cope, and really if you can, having sort of several ways in which they can cope, um, not only does it manage anxiety, but it usually increases confidence, otherwise known as self-worth. So do you have a question? Um. Just to, to sort of further that thought, what happens when we, we've all seen kids who are, are maxed out? You know, mm -hmm. you cannot add another activity. You cannot tell them to go to another thing. They already have, you know, four AP classes, an SAT review course. They're trying to fill out their college resume and, you know, go to interviews and do all that stuff. And to say, you know, oh, you might want to look at the yearbook club, it's not, that's not helpful. You know, right. they're, they've already hit the wall. Right. And motivation at that point is very difficult. Right. You know? and I yeah. know a lot of parents look at that, that junior or senior and say, there isn't another minute I yep. can make this kid do something. Yeah. <laughs> So if I, real quick, if I could just comment on that. So the question was, how do you take, uh, you know, a young person who's already maxed out and their schedules, you know, really got no room in it, um, you know, to, to, to create some motivation. Um, and, and, you know, we've got kids like that where they're doing excessive things and then we've got kids that aren't doing very much at all. Um, and, and really, I, I think, you know, f from my perspective, the one uh, tip I would give you is just keep in mind where we're going with all of this. We want our kids healthy and happy. Right, and um, you know, I know a lot of people. I graduated Sims Ray, so I'm very familiar with the town. I know a lot of people in this area that are trying to pile on, you know, excessive extracurricular activities to get their child somewhere. And in my opinion, there's a threshold, you know. Um, and so, if we push them to that or over that, that's our fault as parents, and we need to just keep in mind where we're going with all of this. Um. It triggered for me when, when you talked about the overbooked. If, if a student's overbooked and they're already in four different clubs and activities and sports and classes, then, then they shouldn't be encouraged to join another club. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day, and I don't think that that's healthy. I think as long as they have their, their foot in the pool of one or two different areas, I think that balance, it's about balance. Now, if it's unidimensional, if a student's in four AP classes but not doing anything extracurricularly, I would say pull back on the AP classes. I, I really, I, I cannot impress upon you enough, um, and we see this so much in, in, um, in good, strong communities here where parents care so much about their students' success and, they, um, and they, they push them to get into great schools, and there's a lot of pressure among peers to, to be in every single AP class and to be at the top of every single class. I think that that's um, Herculean, and I don't think most of our kids are capable of that, and it creates a very stressful situation. I would, 
I would emphasize balance and diversification for your student or for your child, not, um, not excellence in, in one particular area. Yeah. Yeah, while we're on the kind of stream thought that we're talking here, you know, can we get a little bit, and I don't want to cover it forward, but can we get a little bit more to the topic of you know, why is my teen so stressed and what can we do to help? Obviously, sure. the situation this lady just posed is, is real for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're dealing with stresses. How do we help de-stress them? And how do we kind of interact with them when they are stressed? Those are yeah, it's a great question. Great question. And, um, you know, I think um, this next slide speaks to that a little bit in that, um, you know, we have to, uh, it's really our job as parents, we have to constantly assess where our kids are at, you know, and, um, and why they are the way they are, you know. So if we have kids that are excessively stressed, trying to figure out, is it about overscheduling? Is it about underscheduling? Um, is it about something else? And you know, one really important way to get to that is is trying to have conversation with them, and and really letting them educate you as to what their day is like. I've had kids come in to my office that are overwhelmed just with their their, their school classes. You know, they're not doing any activities after school, um, but they then come home and they do excessive amount of homework, and there's really no balance, as Ms. Brockbank was referencing. There's no balance. So, you know, like uh, adults, um, they need to have some fun. They need to have an opportunity to, to uh, you know, come down from their day. And uh, if we're not sort of pushing that, there are some kids that will naturally sort of, um, you know, be the good soldier and just kind of do their work and just continue to get stressed out and stressed out and stressed out. So I think, I think the one piece of advice I'd, I'd throw out there about this topic is that as, as parents, it's really our, our obligation to our kids, it's our job in many ways, to really be looking at that and really assessing it on a regular basis. And things can change. Things can change. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've um, coached sports for years um, for, for my kids and uh, believe that um, that's a wonderful place for kids to learn lots of things, um, but it's not the most important place. And, you know, to me as a parent, it's really important that our kids are ultimately happy. And you may be surprised if you ask your child, um, what makes you happy? You know, just that open-ended question of what makes you happy? You may be very surprised at their response. So trying to work with them, because really, you know, um, we can't let kids just sit around and play with Play-Doh all day long. That's not, you know, um, obviously a, a, good, a good response. But we do need to be able to push our kids, but push them in a way that's healthy, so that allows them to be motivated and reach for things, but not be overwhelmed by things. So, um, you know, being a parent involves lots of different things, as you guys know. Being able to set clear limits with kids and being able to respond when our kids, you know, cross over that line that we don't want them crossing over. Um, I think probably, uh, you know, the, the um, really important word on this slide is, or, or phrase is, without judgment. Okay? So, parents ask me all the time, how do I get my kid to open up? And usually my response is, well, what's it like for them talking to you? Right? Because if, if, if you say to your child, you know, I really want to talk about your day, but you're, you know, you're giving them that message of I'm going to judge everything you have to say, every little thing, um, and you're not open-minded to hearing what they have to say, you're really turning them off. So going into those conversations and recognizing you're probably going to hear a bunch of stuff that you'd really like to comment on and really like to have more conversation on, but if you get them talking, it's now our job to listen and really let them talk to us and educate us. So without judgment is really, really important advice. Um, and it's hard. It's really, really hard, guys, because you know, we're invested in our kids. And uh, they may say things that really you know, scare us um, and really upset us. And we can talk about that with them, but we really want to give them that notion of we're not going to judge what they have to say. If you're going to be willing to take the step to talk to us, we're not going to judge your, your response. The other thing that comes to mind is, um, and again, I think just communication, but talking to your kid, if you find that they're really, really stressed, or if they're saying to you they're really stressed, help them kind of break it down. Tell me all the parts about that. And, um, oh, I just completely lost my train of thought. But, but I think just having that dialogue with them and helping them problem solve, I know what I was going to say. I think a lot of times our kids have an assumption of what's important to us and what we want to hold them accountable to. And sometimes that's not really accurate. And you might be willing to say, 
give that club up or give that sport up or you know you, I don't care if you continue to take piano lessons or whatever it is and and they assume I think a lot of times kids feel sort of a self-imposed pressure of what they assume their parents expect of them and I think it's good to have dialogue with them and, and if they're feeling as if they're juggling too many balls help them sort out what's a reasonable thing to let go of if, if I can use myself as an example, just having grown up in town and gone to school in town as well, um, you know, um, I, I t talk to parents a lot about college and this transition to college and, and where in which they want their, their kids to go. Um, and I sit and I talk to people about intimate things all the time in my office. I have my degrees on the wall. I went to UConn for undergraduate as well as graduate school. And in 20 years, I've been asked five times where I went to school. Three of them, really, they just wanted to talk about basketball. So, you know, I, t I tell the story because, you know, honestly, people don't care. They really don't care. Um, so if we're pushing our kids because we believe they need to go Ivy League or we believe they need to go to this school or that school, um, we have to consider as parents at what cost, at what cost. Um, you know, school is, is important, but life is supposed to be fun as well. So if we're, if we're as parents, if we're pushing on something and creating an imbalance for them, then it's our job to really sort of take a look at that. Um, I think we're heading into. Okay. So yeah, to segue into more on the transition to college, a couple of things that I sort of commented on already: freedom and responsibility. A, a tremendous amount of freedom. It's wonderful. It's very exciting, and it comes with a good degree of responsibility too. Lots of accountability for poor decision making later on down the road. Uh, identity. Identity development is huge. For a, a number of these students, they are going to have come from one particular place where they know everybody. They've got their group. They've got their friends. They've got their family. And now they're in a completely new setting. They have to completely redefine who am I? Who are these people? Do I want to? Do I want to be with them? Is there trial and error in that? Roommate issues. All kinds of fun stuff come through that, and it's not easy. Uh, social network. We talked a little bit about uh, the importance of social uh, networks. It, it's, it's huge. You want that. That's a good thing. You want for them as they're uh, going into adolescence and young, young adulthood to really start to get into their peer group and want to be a part of that. And at the same time, who are they with? And are they making good choices? And are those good influences? Um, unstructured learning. One of the biggest challenges that a lot of students face is that when they're in high school, a lot of the work that they have to do, the actual workload, it's, it's stuff that uh, they, it's tracked. They're given something, they do it, they turn it in, it's monitored. If they start falling behind, somebody's going to be on them about that. And they're not going to slip too far before somebody starts putting them back on track. The thing about college is that sometimes you're going to have a test, maybe two, major qu quizzes and, and a paper, and then that's it. What you did in the meantime, how you managed your time, how you studied for that, uh, that's really on you. There's resources available, there's supports available, but a lot of it is going to be self-advocacy. Did you ask for those supports? Did you go get tutoring? Did you go to the Accessibility Services Center? for support with uh, maybe a learning disability or ADHD. In high school, they're going to have a group of people to help them navigate that, to modify courses, to support them. When you get to college, if you don't self-advocate <coughs> and inform uh, your instructor that you have a disability and you need extended time on exams or whatever the uh, accommodation is, you're not going to get it. Nobody's going to do that for you. And that's a huge transition uh, for a lot of our students coming into college. Adjustment in general. There's lots of things that go into that, being, again, away from family, from their major supports. And the biggest thing that I, I will highlight that I, I think if I can give one recipe for students to be successful in college is to engage. Get engaged in it. 
whatever it is as we were talking about that they're passionate about, if it's playing a sport, if it's playing an instrument, if it's being a part of a club or an organization, go find other students that are interested in the same thing. It probably exists and it's a great club and if it doesn't, you can create your own. And that's one of the wonderful things about that. As soon as they feel connected, usually it makes all of the other things, including their academics, go much better. Uh, and then stress. How can they manage stress? So a lot of the stress that you're going to be seeing now when your uh, child is in high school uh, or earlier, how can you get them to start managing that stress too? Can you start talking to them about something but not necessarily fix it for them? Be careful about the fixing. At some point, they're going to need to start learning how to resolve their own problems and become their own advocate. So before you jump in and fix, maybe talk to them about what, what do you think needs to be done? What might you do about this? Can you go talk to someone about this? Because they're really going to need those skills when they come to college. They're not going to have you there. They're going to be on their own, expected to start managing much of that on their own. Now, again, there's going to be some safety nets, but the more that they can empower themselves and the more that you can assist them with that uh, in preparation for this transition, the better off they're going to be. You know, one of the things we had talked about earlier on tonight um, before the presentation was how many kids we all see, um, you know, turning 18, going to college, and not having worked a job. And um, I think, you know, one generation ago, many of us were working many jobs throughout high school. Um, and I, I only mention that because I think that there are, uh, there is a tie to um, what we were just discussing in terms of what's necessary at college that I, I try to push parents to consider in high school. So your kids can volunteer, your kids can get part-time jobs, and what they get out of that is a sense of responsibility, you know, having to be somewhere, having to answer to a boss that's not mom or dad. Um, you know, having to do things that perhaps they're not thrilled about doing, um, but they're getting paid in some cases for doing that. But probably one of the best parts they get out of doing that is having to be able to uh, sort of walk that plank, if you will, and take that step that they need in college to go seek out a professor and ask for help. Take that step of asking for employment or asking if a place needs some help and, and some volunteer help. Um, because for a lot of kids, that one step is so difficult. I think there's a connection between that and kids uh, relating to kids on a, on a cyber level um, and uh, never really having to engage, you know, um, face to face. And so to me, that, that is something that, you know, you asked earlier, what are some things parents can do? That's one thing parents can do is to push their kids to be in that tough, difficult spot that we've all been in where you get nervous but you walk in anyway, and you're asked to speak to the store manager, and uh, perhaps it's a little awkward, um, but the way you get good at doing those things is you do them. So it's really, really important because to me, that's in some ways the first steps of engagement, and those are skills that you clearly need on a college campus. Yes. I was, it's sort of a, a story, but I sent two kids off to college, and. I talked to a housing administrator at one of those colleges, and he said one of the main problems they have with putting kids together as roommates is so many kids nowadays, as we have fewer children and we have bigger houses, is they've never slept in the same room with somebody. <laughs> so these kids have never shared a room with anybody. And they're like, send them to camp. Send them to you know a, a conference. Send them to something where they have to share a room mm -hmm. with another person mm -hmm. who's their age because mm -hmm. So many of them show up having never been away from home on their own, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden they have this person or three sharing their space. Yeah, and they can't do it. It is a great point. Yes, <laughs> send them to camp. Yes, I send like them it. To camp. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I want to get, just give you a couple of statistics. These are national statistics. This is put out by the American College Health Association survey. It's one of the largest surveys that are done on college campuses across the nation. And this is over a 12-month period, so one-year period. And this was done in 2016. 60% of the students reported feeling overwhelming anxiety. Anxiety has overtaken depression as the number one complaint for our students uh, coming in seeking mental health care. 38% felt so depressed that they felt it was difficult to function. So certainly there's a lot of distress that our students are feeling. 
Uh, this is something that is uh, it's creating a lot of demand for counseling centers, as we'll, we'll go into. But um, it's a challenge. You know, how can we help our students figure out how to cope with some of these stressors? Sure. On one other thing, so just a quick segue into dorm room counseling. We we jumped over it earlier, but dorm room counseling is a an online um, business that we've developed, um, and uh, that is um, an opportunity for kids to be able to see uh, a counselor uh, in the privacy of their own room, essentially um, on on a college campus. And for many kids that are experiencing overwhelming amount of anxiety and depressive symptoms, uh, some of those kids just don't make it to the counseling centers. The counseling centers across the state are doing a phenomenal job with their students, um, but there are a lot of kids out there with a lot of very difficult things that they're dealing with. And if you think about sort of the formula that we were just discussing of all of the changes that happen, so those kids in high school that have their group of friends, they have the school down, they could walk around with their eyes closed, they know the staff, they're hiring everybody, they hit the reset button and they go to college and they don't know anyone. So they're in an environment that's entirely new. They're having to live communally, which many kids just don't understand and have never done before. Um, you know, and, and they're just around a number of new things. And for kids that aren't used to that, um, their adjustment becomes very, very difficult. So next, we'll talk about students at risk. So this is the same survey over a 12-month period. We have. Just about 7% of students reported intentionally cutting, burning, bruising, or otherwise injuring themselves. 10% seriously considered suicide. And nearly 2% attempted suicide. So certainly these numbers are distressing. Uh, there are a lot of safety nets to try to support students who are feeling at risk. For example, some of the things that uh, most colleges are doing, certainly we are as well, is we have entire teams that discuss and uh, meet on a weekly basis, if not more often as needed, to discuss students who are at risk and figure out how can we best support them? What additional services do they need? How can we make sure that the community is safe? But these are uh, real concerns that some of our students, uh, unfortunately, who are not getting help or who are really struggling, they, they can be at risk. So increasing demand for services on college campuses is something that's probably been uh, being talked about by college counseling centers across the nation uh, more than probably any other topic. Really trying to figure out how do we continue to meet the demands for, uh, for counseling that we're seeing that are growing and growing every year. And it's amazing the work that I think the counseling centers are doing on college campuses, how innovative uh, they are. I'm very proud of the work, for example, that our counseling center uh, is doing uh, to maximize the, the, um, the work, being able to get out there and talk to students, destigmatize help seeking, and support them in, in gaining some of these skills to be able to uh, be successful in college. But with that said, a lot of what is happening is that the treatment that we're providing is, is becoming more uh, brief and goal-focused. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but for those who are interested in longer-term treatment or for treatment that's beyond the scope of what a college counseling center can provide, it's important to know that there are other options, and a lot of that ends up being referrals to community providers. Uh, wait lists is another uh, concern that some college counseling centers are having. Uh, we are successfully avoiding a wait list uh, at my counseling center, but I know that that's certainly a struggle that lots of counseling centers are, are dealing with, where you'll have students come in requesting services. They might be triaged, uh, so in order to determine essentially what their level of risk is, and then they may be waiting a few weeks before they're actually able to start services simply based on the number of students that are, are coming in. Uh, and then referrals off campus, as I mentioned. Uh, there's uh, a lot of really wonderful providers. We're lucky uh, at the University of Hartford that we have so many great providers in the community. We, uh, when we do refer a student out uh, that's looking for something uh, longer term or beyond the scope of what we can provide, the nice thing is we've got great providers in the area uh, who, who can do that. Still, our number one challenge, and really the challenge uh, for most centers when you're thinking about referrals, is it's inconvenient. Transportation becomes a bit of an issue. You know, how do students get to these appointments uh, is a challenge. And then also insurance or money issues can, can also be uh, a challenge. 
that's another thing that I think is interesting about dorm room counseling is that by providing uh, the service virtually through your device, through your computer, uh, talk to a, a counselor through your screen, all of a sudden it takes the inconvenience and the transportation factor out of the equation and makes uh, accessibility for students who are interested in, in care uh, that much better. So how to support your college student. Just a couple of, of nuggets of information I thought I would share with you all. One, uh, again, we've talked about this a few times, but listen supportively. Try to really listen before advising, if you can, uh, just to get the full picture. Uh, encouraging self-advocacy before fixing. How can they take some steps to be able to uh, resolve the problem on their own and encouraging them to do that? Suggest the engagement. Suggest that they connect. This might be as simple as if they're planning in the first few weeks and uh, coming home every weekend, encourage them not to. Encourage them not to. Encourage them to stay. Participate in the activities that are going on on campus. Um, support their uh, interest in jobs and internships and adulting. Y'all heard this term, adulting, right? Isn't that fun? Ah, yeah, things that, you know, <laughs> we, we have a term for it. It's adulting. Oh, I hate adulting. It's so annoying. Yeah. Uh, adulting, internships, jobs, real world responsibility. Let's get them to do that. Uh, let's encourage that. Openly discuss important issues like sex, like alcohol, like drugs, like their academics, but also understand that there are going to be some privacy restrictions when they come to college. For most students, when you're coming to college, you are an adult. The Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, uh, essentially what this means is uh, you are no longer given access to a student's academic record unless they give you permission to do that. You can call up the uh, university and you can, you can ask how they're doing and you will be given no information unless you have signed, uh, the student has signed a waiver that will give you access to that information because they're an adult, technically. So it's an important thing to know about and a lot of times this can be as simple as when you're going to campus or when you're talking about the FERPA waiver, can I get that signed? Hey, uh, talk to your, 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 uh, your child. I'd like you to sign that so that we can have conversations and I can monitor how you're doing or have a better awareness of how you're doing. With that said, you also do want to attempt to give them a little bit of freedom, right? Um, let them work some of this out on their own. Hopefully they have some skills to help them to do that. Other privacy restrictions, of course, are if they come to a counseling center uh, on campus. We operate as any other mental health agency would. Just because we're on campus doesn't mean that uh, we do anything different. There is nothing indicated on the academic record that would indicate that the person came to the counseling center. Confidentiality is fully applicable. Meaning that if you call up the counseling center and say, I know that my child comes to the counseling center, you're going to be given no information. We can't confirm or deny that that person comes to our counseling center unless they've signed a release that would allow that to happen. Okay? It, that is if they are an adult, but most, most students are. If they're a minor, we'll have to get permission uh, from a parent to actually begin treatment with them. But uh, for most of our students, they're adults. Uh, refer to available resources. So knowing when you go to campus, what are the resources? Going to those parent panels, going to those things and finding out, okay, there's a student success center. All right, great. Oh, there's an accessibility services center. Okay, what do they provide? All right, there's a, now, the more that you kind of have some awareness or even of, uh, of this, the more you might be able to help guide or direct your, uh, your child to start moving towards those if they're needing assistance and at the same time, Trying to encourage that self-advocacy piece, right? Can they do that? But being aware of what the resources are is helpful. And then ask for support when needed. I love the comment about, um, you know, talk to a friend. Talk to somebody who's been there. Talk to a family member. Uh, you can call the campus. I will be honest. We get some interesting calls on campus. Some calls like, oh, you know, uh, Johnny's not going to be able to go to class today because he's sick. All right. Maybe Johnny could have sent that email, right? <laughs> Uh, but honestly, the same thing is happening when students are now going into the working world, right? Mom or dad is contacting their employer and saying, hey, uh, Johnny's not going to be able to show up to work today because he's, he's not feeling so well. 
okay, well maybe Johnny should make that phone call, right? Little things like that. Again, being cautious and thoughtful about how can I encourage the independence and autonomy that they're going to need to do their adulting, right? Okay. Yeah. I love that term. Yeah. I just, just wanted to mention one other thing, Nick. So you covered that beautifully, and I think it's important for, for those of you that have kids in middle school and high school to be thinking about this, because this is the next step, obviously, for many kids after high school. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about what can parents do uh, to assist their kid in kind of bridging that gap. Um, so, so certainly one of those, one of those uh, suggestions is, is making sure that they're doing certain things independently and, and forcing them in some ways to uh, advocate to a teacher, an English teacher, let's say, that they're having difficulty with, having them send the email, having them go back in and speak with that teacher directly because those are skills they're, they're going to need to have uh, when they go off to college. Um, and, and lots of kids won't like that. Um, but again, I think, you know, in order for you to, to gain that level of independence, um, they're going to have to be, you know, forced, forced into that in some ways. I will also say, too, that, you know, on, on a very positive note, um, many of my uh, kids that I work with, um, when they leave for college and, uh, and they come back to see me uh, during the holidays, um, in that three-month period, 16 weeks, um, you know, that a parent has their young person at school, uh, they come back it's so mature so mature, uh, blow you away how mature they are, um, because they've really had three full months of caring for themselves, you know, and making friends, and advocating, and engaging, and, uh, you know, really working on things for themselves. Um, so they come home, and, you know, as a parent, you're shocked when they make themselves a sandwich, you know, uh, or they talk about setting an internship up a month in advance. You know, um, but those are the skills that if we as parents can pull back when we launch our kids to go off to those environments, those are the skills that they come back with. And they're pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So why don't we take uh, some time to just open things up to you guys. I know you've asked some great questions already, but um, certainly would love to, to just um, uh, open things up and give you an opportunity to ask some questions to either myself or the other two panelists here. Start over here. The statistics you gave about can, the, uh, can I give you can I give you this about the students feeling overwhelmed, the sixty percent, and then the thirty eight percent being depressed. So that's a subjective um, response from the students. It, it is a self report response. Yes. So what is the actual diagnosis? Is there anything clinically to show these kids have it? I mean, are they just talking to their friends and saying, "Oh, I've got anxiety," or you know, is that like a buzzword on campus? Or you know. I mean, is there any tough love? I'm not trying to be, but, you know, I mean, yeah. where's all this coming from? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, I think in some ways depression and anxiety, just the terms, are just more common in the vernacular for, for our young people. They're more willing to use those terms than maybe we were. And it may not carry the same meaning uh, in, in some ways, as a clinical term, when we mean when we talk about these things clinically, actually, a lot of sort of what we end up doing for some of our students is they will come in having self-diagnosed themselves. It's like they read too much WebMD, right? And part of what we're doing is sort of no, actually, what you're dealing with, it, you know, maybe it isn't anxiety, maybe it's just it's worry, right? It's worry, and and that's that's actually okay. Lots of people have that. Let's let's stop and let's normalize a little bit what you're going through. So yes, I I do understand that. Uh, I think it's a great point. A lot of uh, this is it's a self-report. The diagnosis, though, uh, you should know that anxiety is, has overtaken. Uh, depression is the number one diagnosable condition for most of our, our students coming in. And we are seeing increasing demands for services. So students are coming more to counseling. That would be the time where they would receive a diagnosis. Uh, and what they're struggling with, the level of anxiety. The important part about most diagnoses is they kind of all come down to, is it substantially impairing their functioning? And for our students, when it hits that level where absolutely it's substantially impairing their functioning, well, then they meet criteria for the diagnosis. And uh, again, I would say there's a couple of things that are happening just, just generally that, that we're seeing. One, uh, a lot of our students, they're struggling with feelings of isolation. They're struggling with feeling like they're not connected with their peer group, which is interesting in a time when they're more sort of uh, virtually connected than they've ever been. 
uh, in reality, they feel like they're, they're more isolated, like they don't have the genuine, meaningful relationships, and they don't know how to start them. They don't know how to say hello. That's anxiety produced. So they just look at their phone, right? I don't know how many times you see this. You see a crowd of, of six, uh, you know, uh, teenage young people all sitting around going like this. They're probably sending off messages saying how much everybody else is missing out on the great time they're having, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, how do you put that down and like shake someone's hand and say hello? Simple social skills, really, really important. And that's where I say boundaries, just putting it away for a little while, having them uh, disengage from that, if, whether it's at a job, whether it's at employment, whether it's at uh, a club or an organization. I think that's part of it is that they're just interacting with each other and it's, it's not through anything else. So social skills, really important. The other is resiliency, grit. Little bumps in the road, things that we would think are pretty normative. You know, you don't do so well on one of your exams, or you have a breakup, or whatever it is. Yeah, these things, they can feel awful, but maybe now they're more likely to actually put someone at risk because they're just unable to cope with it. And I think part of that is maybe they've never actually had to independently cope with it before. Maybe it's been something that lovingly, well-intentioned, has been fixed for them to the extent that it could. It's been controlled, it's been monitored, and now they don't have that anymore. And they have to figure it out on their own, and it's really hard. And so you have adults that will get a C on an exam, and it's the first one they've ever gotten, and they'll feel like they just, they're gonna disappoint everybody, they're a failure, and maybe they should just not live anymore. And it's hard to understand why they would feel that strongly about that. Uh, it's okay, but part of that perspective taking uh, that, that they sort of need isn't there. I would say another thing that's interesting is just intergenerational exposure as I think actually a really good thing. The sharing of your stories uh, is a really wonderful thing because sometimes that can actually provide perspective for folks that, you know, when you're a teenager and you're, you're out uh, with all of your other teenage friends, it can feel like the smallest slight is just the biggest thing in the world. It's the biggest thing in the world. You couldn't imagine anything worse. And then you hear a story from somebody who's been through a, like, a lot of things, really tough times, and all of a sudden maybe it puts a little more perspective on it. So feel free to share your stories. It may feel like they're not interested in it, but I bet they are. I bet they are. So. Nick, if I could just comment on one yeah. thing. Resiliency is so important. And you know, I think that when um, you know, our kids are growing, one of the best pieces of advice is I was offered in, in, uh, when, my, when my daughter was in seventh grade was her English teacher said uh, at an open house to us, if, if they're not doing well, let them fail now. Let them fail. Like, let them fall down. Let them, and the key word is tolerate. Let them tolerate the stress of what that feels like so they learn how to. So you just got me thinking when you were talking about resiliency, I see so many kids that have such a low ability to tolerate stress that you know they really haven't been given the opportunity to be resilient um, and then some of them will go to college campuses and they're faced with you know increasing stress and they just don't know how to handle it so you know in in middle school and in high school when we have that ability to teach it's hard for us as parents to have our child be in pain and to be sad you know um, but in many ways we're helping them learn how to tolerate those feelings because they're human feelings and we should feel those periodically so how do you help your college student when they call you the first time and they've never gotten to see and they've just gotten one? You know, how do you have that comp you've, you know, pushed them along in all their AP classes and all their things and now they're at a really great college and everybody else is as smart as they are. <laughs> they're not the smartest person in the class anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's that first C and all of a sudden it's, you know, it's like a gut punch, you know, they're just like, mm. oh my God, I, I'm really not that smart. You know? I, I, I will say, I think the very first thing that you've done right is you've been, um, you've been somebody that your daughter can talk to about that. And so just to have that dialogue and again, normalize that, of course, it would be naive to expect that they're going to go through college without having some mistakes along the way. And uh, that's one thing I was going to say after Mark was talking is, um, so on bringing it back to a high school level, um, I don't know how many of you guys have high school kids, but we've got um, a, a resource there called Power School where st parents can access their kids' um, grades and students can. 
And likewise, Nick was talking about it on a college level. And I will say, I, I think, and it depends. I mean, it depends on how much support your child needs. But I think sometimes in our community, parents access that too much. And, and I think about it like, you know, when you're driving, you're supposed to kind of be like aiming about 200 yards ahead of you. You know, you're not supposed to be kind of like zigzagging up and down the road. And sometimes, as long as your child knows what your expectation is, whether that's you know, for you to have B's or A's or C's or just pass. Um, how they get there is really kind of their business. And as parents, I think it's it's hard to not micromanage that. But maybe we shouldn't be logging into power school quite so, so often. And if they flunk a test or if they do poorly, then it's up to them to work out extra credit, to have dialogue with a teacher, and to be practicing that kind of self-advocacy and negotiating um, on a high school level so that when they get to a college level, they're, and they, and they below, um, or they, they perform below their uh, um, norm, they, they know, okay, I guess I gotta pull my bootstraps up and try harder and go talk, make sure I hit the you know, teacher's office hours and, and figure it out, because I think, we're not doing them favors on a high school level if we're hovering and um, making them kind of stay really tightly to that perfection. And I would also say one of the things that they're often most concerned about is rejection. They're concerned that if they don't do well, then they're going to be a disappointment. So making sure to let them know that you love them and you care about them, and of course you do, but that isn't going to go away because they get a C on an exam. That, I can't tell you how many times our students, uh, that is their biggest, one of their biggest fears is that they're going to be a disappointment and they just can't face that. And so again, it's sort of, we'll let them fall and then let them know it's, it's okay if you do. It's all right. It's, it's so much, there's so much more important things than, the, to, to me, loving you than, than having you get a C. We'll work on it. We'll get through it. And being realistic with them, you know, that we're going to have some fails. That's part of life, right? Um, you know, and uh, I don't know how many of you on a regular basis get asked about your C's when you, you had them in college, but I never get asked about it. So, you know, to me, it's, um, it, it's part of going through the educational process, part of becoming an adult and learning how to deal with those things and be resilient and bounce back. So I love what you guys said and, and really reminding our kids that, you know, we're teaching them, we're putting them in environments in college and in high school, we're teaching them as much as we can uh, that sometimes in life things don't go our way, that's okay. You know, life isn't supposed to go our way all the time. Do you have another question? Mark, I was just going to ask, I mean, uh, part of the emphasis of both high school and college is just telling kids you're going to have stress and there's people you can go to access. Absolutely. How effectively do you see students responding to that? Because it does seem to me the higher, the more sophisticated they are at responding. As a parent, it's a pretty simple thing just to kind of mimic that. And this is really what you're saying. You're going to have stress, know who to go to if you do. So how, how effectively do, are you seeing students responding to that culture of making them aware yeah. and, and, and that there are resources that they can go to regardless of what they're experiencing? It's a great question. I, I think um, part of the reason dorm room counseling was even, even you know, um, created was that, um, you know, for kids it really um, helps them shift into assistance through their mode of communication. So kids, you know, um, kids are on their technology on a regular basis and as parents we don't love that. Um, but I had the thought of why fight that? Like if we can get them, you know, assistance and help some of those people that otherwise may not get assistance, um, then perhaps that's, you know, the, the road to use uh, for kids. I, I also think, too, as parents, for us to just normalize the fact that everybody needs help. You know, and um, people ask me sometimes, and I have no problem telling them that I've seen counselors. Um, you know, and, and to me, I think it's a very human thing to be able to admit that, you know, we've got some things from time to time that we need some assistance with. And it's really not that big a deal. Um, you know, so if, if, if a parent's giving that message or a mentor or another adult in the world is giving them that message, they're more inclined, I think, to take the step versus, uh, you know, be uh, nervous about who's going to see them go in the building, uh, what will it be like, will their parents get a phone call, all the things that, uh, that uh, Dr. Pinkerton covered earlier uh, that really just don't exist because they're, really, they're, they're, they're offered in many ways the luxury on a college campus of complete privacy. 
and you know the ability to speak to really qualified professionals uh, who also know the campus and are willing to connect with uh, you know other individuals if need be um, to really help them and support them. Imagine you have a thought or two on that. Yeah. So um, I think that was that was beautifully said. I think that they are accessing. I think I, I would probably say the thing that stops them from accessing services. It's not that they're not getting a lot of advertisement that these things are there. It's that. It's anxiety provoking just the idea of actually going out and, and, and walking into that office and making an appointment or saying hello to a counselor or saying hello to someone, an advisor or a support person. Uh, so again, I think to the extent that you can encourage them to do that now, do that. Get them to go and make that appointment. Get them to go and send that email. Get them to do that because that's the skill that they're going to need. Uh, they're going to need to be able to do that. So. Um, I, I, and also, just to speak to this for, for, for a, a quick second, anxiety, right? We're seeing more and more of that. What is that? In some ways, it's really fear and worry. And what do we know is the most effective treatment primarily for anxiety? It's exposure. Far and away, it's exposure. What is exposure? Exposure means leaning into the thing that you're afraid of. Yeah. 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 Leaning into it and moving past it and figuring out how to master your fear and realize that it's not all that scary and you can handle it. That is the number one treatment we know of for anxiety. And so what our job in some ways really is when everybody has a fear or a worry is helping them to figure out how to lean into that fear, work through it, get through it and master it so that they can come out the other side not feeling so afraid. Well said. Well said. Other questions people may have? Just one quick one. Sure. Uh, the kids are very used to and comfortable with their guidance counselors. When they get to college, what counseling, but what is what is it called when they get to the unit? Because it's not guidance in this academic sense. Sure. What do you call the service? It's a great question. And you know, there's so many resources on campuses, and each one is a, a little bit different. If you've been to one college, you've been to one college. <laughs> uh, so I, I think there's different ways that they do it. Typically, there's academic advisors. And these are folks that help them not only get their, uh, their courses set, but they also can assist them if there's challenges. But there's also additional resources usually. Uh, for example, on our campus, there's a student success center. And this is a center that's, that's completely uh, integrated into their academics. If there's an academic warning, if there's something going on where they're either not showing up for classes or not doing well for classes, they're going to be notified. They're going to be reaching out to the student. They're going to be calling them in. They're going to be assisting them, trying to hook them up with free tutoring, time management. Uh, and then in addition, we have, again, uh, the Accessibility Services Office for students who have disabilities or need accommodations. We have uh, the Dean of Students. We would just have lots of different people. What are we called? Okay, so we're called the Counseling Center or CAPS, Cou uh, Counseling and Psychological Services. So that's wh where we would be. Yeah, thanks. So that's like usually going to a mental health clinic. Right. Um, well, for students that are used to guidance counselors, right. it's not something that they can go down the hall at the high school and get your type of services. So right. I'm just curious right. how you differentiate yourself as a counselor. Right. When they're used to a guidance counselor, it's called something as an academic advisor when they get to college, but counseling is still a term that's used. Right. Well, let's not overlook. We have amazing social workers also on the high school level. But you're right. It is different, I think, being outside of the building and the things that they're able to do. I will say also, um, you know, having a, a, an office in West Hartford, not far from the UHart campus, um, I've had students, you know, um, that are, are, are uh, currently going to University of Hartford and they work in concert with outside professionals in such a way that if I've had uh, a, a patient of mine uh, that's seen me for, for a period of time that's now going to campus and wants to see someone in their counseling center, they simply sign a waiver, we connect, we pass the baton, and those kids are now assisted on campus. So it becomes a real tidy system. Uh, as long as we have a student who's willing to make it a tidy system, um, but certainly University of Hartford has some amazing services, as do, as do many of the colleges in the area. Yes? You talk about um, kids who are in high school and where they can re get counseling or, or um, find out about different services, mm -hmm. and then the student or child who goes off to college and where they could go. What about a college student who is living at home? What is your recommendations for that? Should they 
look for resources at the college that they're commuting to, mm -hmm. um, or should they look for maybe places closer to their home? It's a great question. They actually have the luxury of either. You know, so in many ways, those kids that are commuting, most of them are driving, um, you know, and have the ability to bring themselves, you know, to either an outside professional in uh, the neighborhood of their school or the neighborhood of where they live, uh, the town they live in, um, or certainly the access to on-campus uh, types of uh, counseling that I believe most of the, even the commuter kids, right, are, are, yeah. are, uh, have that availability to them. So they actually have more access in some ways, commuters, than because uh, uh, some of the kiddos that are on campus that don't have the ability to transport, um, you know, they're, they're relegated on campus or the nearby area. So in some ways, those kids have a wider, a wider opportunity. But is one more preferable based on, you know, should they go to the college counselor because, you know, their whole academic is, is at that, that school or the social life of the clubs or... Yeah. So is one more preferable? Or? It's a great question. I think it depends on the, on the student. You know, um, to me, I, I've always said for all of my patients that, you know, in counseling, it's really about the right fit. Um, you know, and for, for a patient to feel comfortable or a student to feel comfortable with the counselor they're talking to is huge. Um, so if, if they're seeking somebody out or they have someone that they feel comfortable with and they want to stay with that person, that's totally fine. I've had patients of mine, uh, you know, in that particular circumstance, um, want to stay with me but they're on campus but they want me to connect with campus. So I'll call over to the counseling center uh, on their behalf or uh, perhaps another department on their behalf uh, with permission from them in order to, to connect because certainly you know an outside professional um, you know working in an environment like West Hartford I'm not going to know a college campus the way uh, college staff would so um, certainly that's that's an avenue that you can take um, but I, I really feel like it's about fit and if, if that particular student's feeling comfortable with a counselor really anywhere um, they should continue to work with that person if they need to yeah and I completely agree with what Mark's saying, but I, I think it really is about the individual um, needs and issues that the child is having or the young adult is having. Because another way of looking at it is um, sometimes students will want to have a real separation between their counseling space and their counseling kind of mental um, zone and their, their friends and their social network and their educational place. So I think for some kids it might be really nice to have a counselor that's you know, based where their school is, and others might really want to have like some geographic distance between, you know, where they're a student and where they wear, where they wear that hat, and you know where they um, have a more introspective and reflective experience. Um, the same on the high school level. There there are some kids that um, that you know really are comfortable doing counseling in school. Um, but I, I would say for the majority, I think especially if it's really kind of like deep therapy work, that's better done outside of school because it's really hard to kind of fillet yourself open emotionally and then go out to class, you know, half an hour later. It's, it's you know, I, I can speak for myself even in terms of my commute to and from work. Sometimes I use that drive to kind of gear up my thoughts for something and to kind of gear down. And, and I think sometimes it might be nice to have a separation, um, whereas other kids may feel like it, it's nice to have it all one-stop shopping. Other questions? I think part of the problem, too, mm -hmm. um, is that when they're home, there's less chance for them to self-advocate because when you're off at college, you're kind of forced to a little bit more. But when you're home, it's almost like you were still living at home when you were 16. Mm -hmm. and so you've got that whole thing thrown in there, yeah. too. It makes it a little more challenging. Yeah, it's challenging. I think you have to be really creative and just look for those options for kids because I think they're there. Um, you know, and, and I think in some ways what I see parents doing is naturally taking those opportunities away from them. So, you know, I, I, I try to push the idea of keeping in mind that the jump is coming, you know, and uh, when they're on a college campus, we're not going to be there. Um, and trust me, no professor is going to want to hear from parents. Um, so they're really going to need that skill. So our, our kids may not thank us, you know, for pushing them to advocate to their teachers or to go after class to speak to the scary math teacher or someone that they feel uncomfortable with. But the experience, I think, of going back and realizing, hey, that person's not really that scary. And actually, they were really pretty cool. You know, they helped me. Um, and they were, in some ways, their personality was really likable. So maybe I'll go back and do that more. 
I think that experience of, of you know, a parent kind of turning their kid to do that um, is really our opportunity to help them self-advocate. So they're, they're there. I, I agree with you, there's, there's um, maybe less of them than on a college campus. Um, but, but just reminding them that, you know, you go to college and um, I tell families, it's like the biggest sleepover you've ever been to. You know, there's like, you know, a couple hundred kids in a building. And uh, you need to have those skills to be able to uh, be friendly and have those conversations and maybe ask to go to breakfast with somebody um, or just get to know someone and have a conversation about a, a topic like football or, you know, uh, something else that might be going on that's, that's sort of, um, you know, in, in the, in the uh, normalcy of our day. Um, if they don't have those skill sets, they're going to really struggle at school. So, you know, it, it really becomes more important for us, I think, as parents to really push our kids, especially the, the, the sophomores, juniors, and seniors as they're transitioning, to really have those opportunities and, and push them to take them. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, guys, for coming, and um, appreciate it. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.